Hello, welcome to another video from the conscientious biologist, Ben Gallagher. This one's the ninth one in the body communication series, and we look at the menstrual cycle, or more specifically, how hormones of the endocrine system control the menstrual cycle and all the changes that happen within the female reproductive system in that monthly cycle after puberty. This is from the GCSE specification. I think it's one of the most difficult things to get your head around, which is why I've broken it down to some really logical, straightforward steps with really nice visuals in this presentation. So if you don't understand it at all, watch the video again, replay little sections, and hopefully it will all become clear. As always, please do subscribe to my YouTube channel if you haven't done so already. Thank you. Let's start off with the really vital question of what is the menstrual cycle, or more significantly, why does it happen? So the menstrual cycle is something that affects women after puberty and it's in the reproductive system of women. So if I put a woman up there, you can see where the reproductive system is. You will have studied the reproductive system earlier in school. But if we just bring up the reproductive system from that diagram to a larger picture, we can identify some of the main structures on here. So you've got these things. There's one on either side. These are the ovaries. Now, the ovaries are an endocrine gland. You'll remember from previous videos, they produce estrogen and progesterone but vitally importantly they're the site of egg production so when a, a baby girl is growing inside her own mother and the fetus is turning into an, uh, um, is growing to turn become a baby within the ovaries of that growing baby meiosis ha is happening to produce immature egg cells so meiosis has already happened in girls before they're even born so within those ovaries there would be hundreds if not thousands of immature eggs okay next part of the system up there we've got the uterus now the uterus is the main chamber of the whole system that's where a baby's going to grow we've got the oviducts or fallopian tubes is their more old-fashioned name it's the oviducts that connect the ovaries to the uterus so an egg when it's released is going to travel down the oviducts to get into the uterus where the baby's hopefully going to grow. At the bottom here we've got the vagina where intercourse will take place and sperm should be released at the cervix and the cervix is that narrow gap that you can see between the vagina and the uterus. So sperm have got to get through the cervix to get to the into the uterus to get to the egg to hopefully fertilize it. Now if we're talking about that egg and the egg release if you see the arrow I've just put on there on this nearest ovary the egg's going to come out of the ovary into the oviduct and start to move its way around the oviduct. Now, if a couple have sex, then the sperm should be released at the cervix and they need to make their way up through into the uterus where they're gonna fertilize the egg. So if I put an egg cell up here and I've got a sperm cell down there, that sperm cell needs to make its way to the egg, fuses with the egg, breaking in through the membrane, releases its nucleus into the egg, and the nucleus of the sperm and the nucleus of the egg will fuse together to make a full set of human DNA. Now, once that happens, and you've got that newly made sort of full diploid nucleus, that fertilized egg, which is now called a zygote, is going to do mitosis to multiply to become an embryo. Now, that embryo up above me here, has so far divided entirely reliant on the nutrients that were inside the egg. But it can't keep doing that. The cells you'll notice are getting smaller and smaller. They're gonna run out of nutrients. They need an external nutrient supply. Well, they can get that external nutrients if they can get themselves onto one of the mother's capillaries, onto her blood supply, so that nutrients from her blood supply can move into the embryo and allow it to continue to grow. Now, this is where we really get to talking about the menstrual cycle, because what you have to have in the uterus is a lining that's made of capillaries. It has to be a very dense capillary network within the uterus. And that lining is called the endometrium. So that's the capillary lining of the uterus. That's so essential because if the egg's going to come out, go around the oviduct, sperm's going to fertilize it. That now fertilized egg multiplying into its embryo must be able to land on capillaries if it's going to get nutrients to keep growing. Now, the problem with that is that capillaries are a really rubbish building material. Think about when we studied diffusion and membrane transport and things like that before. Capillaries work for diffusion, for exchange, because they're only one cell thick. That means nutrients can move in and out of them really quickly, really easily. But if they're one cell thick, they're very fragile and they're going to break down very, very easily. So if you have that capillary lining inside the uterus for ages, 
it's going to break down, get damaged, scar tissue is going to appear. A fertilised egg might land on it, but not actually land on a bit that's any good anymore to not be able to absorb any more um, nutrients from the blood supply. So once a month, the uterus goes, right, it's a bit rubbish now, it's a bit too damaged, let's get rid of it. And it breaks down and it all passes out through the cervix, through the vagina. That's what's commonly called the period. So that time of the month when a woman is bleeding um, because of the breakdown of that capillary lining within the uterus. But at the start of the next month, she'll rebuild a new one so that an egg that gets released the next month can have a brand new good capillary network to land on. If that one hasn't been fertilised, isn't going to grow into a baby, they break down that one and build a new one for the following month and so on and so on. So the purpose really is to keep a fresh, useful capillary lining to the uterus that can be there to feed an embryo should one be fertilised and start to grow inside the uterus. So to summarise that, we can say that for a fertilised egg slash embryo to keep growing, it needs nutrients from the mother's blood. So it means it must implant onto capillaries, so the uterus must be lined with these. However, capillaries are a fragile building material, so the lining, which is the endometrium, gets broken down and rebuilt each month ready for each new egg, because once a month one egg gets released and each one gets a new lining. Now that's a lot of stuff to try and control. You've got to control an egg being released each month, you've got to control building of the endometrium, you've got to control breakdown of the endometrium, there's a lot going on. So how I'm going to simplify this is I'm going to bring up like a clock face that you'd read round just like you would um, on an analogue clock. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to split it up because a menstrual cycle on average is four weeks long. So I can split my clock into four sections there and I can put the days on for those four weeks. So we start at day zero then seven, day 14 in the middle, day 21. And then day 28 is the same as day zero because that's the end of the cycle. So we've got on average this 28 day cycle and in the exam it might ask you how long is the average menstrual cycle? 28 days. Some women have longer menstrual cycles, some women shorter menstrual cycles, but 28 days is the average. Now the first part of the menstrual cycle is when the endometrium, the capillary lining is breaking down. That's what's called menstruation or what is commonly referred to as the period. Uh, but menstruation is that breakdown of the endometrium. So all the hormonal interactions start just after that. So if we picked it about day six, the hormone FSH is secreted from the pituitary. Now I'm going to tell you what FSH stands for. You don't need to know it, but it's useful to know because it helps you understand what it was, uh, what it does. FSH stands for follicle stimulating hormone. It's a hormone that stimulates a follicle. So the next question is, well, what's a follicle? Well, a follicle is just an immature egg. We talked about the ovaries being full of eggs that are made when a girl is growing inside her own mother. Those immature eggs are called follicles. OK, so what FSH does, it travels in the blood down to an ovary. Remember, the key point about all hormones, they travel in the blood, it travels in the blood all around the body. But the ovary has specific receptors that allow it to respond to it because it's the target organ. And the ovary starts to mature that egg or follicle. The follicle has been stimulated, follicle stimulating hormone, FSH. So we've got that first little cause and effect. Now, while the ovary is maturing an egg, the ovary starts to release oestrogen. So it's the maturing egg that causes the ovary to release oestrogen. Now, oestrogen then travels to the uterus or travels everywhere, but the uterus responds to it. And the uterus in response to oestrogen starts to build an endometrium. So we've got these two key things going on here. We've got an egg starting to mature and we've got the endometrium building. Two vital things. Now, oestrogen has another function that I'm going to add up here because oestrogen also has an inhibitory effect. So I've got that arrow going back because oestrogen also inhibits FSH production. Now, that's really important because FSH stimulates a follicle. If you just had FSH continually being released, it would stimulate multiple follicles and a woman would mature multiple eggs and mature, release multiple eggs and could end up having multiple babies, multiple births. Well, that's very hard on the mother. It's harder on the children when they're growing inside. So we as humans have developed this in inhibition mechanism to try and make sure that only one egg is matured per month 
to try and make sure we only have one baby at a time to maximize that one baby's survival chances because it can get all the parents attention it can get the nutrition and everything it needs so this is a really really key little cascade of things that happens very early in the menstrual cycle on about day six or seven okay now the egg is maturing and the endometrium builds up right the way around to about day 14 now and on day 14 the pituitary gland gets involved again and it secretes a hormone called LH. Now LH travels from the pituitary in the brain, travels all around the body in the blood, but its target organ is the ovary and it tells the ovary to release that matured egg. That's called ovulation. So you've had basically from day six or seven to day 14, the ovary's been maturing and sorting that egg out, getting it perfect. On day 14, it's perfect, it's ready, and the pituitary sends a signal to say release it. And the, and the ovaries will pop that egg out, and that mature egg will move into the, uh, into the oviduct. So move down the oviduct or fallopian tube. Now, because the ovary has just released the egg, the ovary is going to stop making oestrogen because remember, it's still above me here, the ovary was only making oestrogen whilst it was maturing an egg. There's no more egg to mature, so it stops releasing oestrogen, and instead, it starts to release progesterone hormone, okay? Now, progesterone is really, really important because for that whole second half of the menstrual cycle, progesterone maintains the endometrium. It helps those capillaries stay in place, keep their structure so they don't break down too early because there's still a chance that egg could be fertilized, could grow into an embryo, would need to implant. So progesterone kind of just keeps everything in check. But when we get near the end to about day 27, the progesterone stops. Now, of course, without progesterone maintaining the endometrium, we get menstruation again, because when progesterone stops, the endometrium has no longer anything to keep it in place. So the endometrium starts to break down and we're back where we started there on day 28 or zero. So I can just add one thing there, that menstruation is the breakdown of the endometrium, but that's due to the lack of progesterone because progesterone stopped on about day 27 after it started being made on about day 14. OK, so this has got all the hormones when they're produced and how but this is quite complex okay so take a shot of this take a screenshot of this so you've got this but we'll go on to explaining it in a couple of different ways now i'm going to describe the same thing that i did on the last slide now but i'm going to do it in a kind of weird graphical type way that i've come up with so i'm going to put the four key hormones on the bottom here next to me and i want you to imagine that we're showing on this slide the level of any of these hormones how much of these hormones are in the blood at any one time okay and we're going to say how much is there on day zero so i'm going to put a zero over there and i'm going to count that along to show how they change but to show how they, uh, they impact on the endometrium, I'm going to put that on this chart as well. Now, on day zero, if you remember, the endometrium is at its thickest still. So it's way up there, up high, because on day zero, that's before it starts to break down. OK, so this is kind of our start position for the endometrium and the four hormones. Let's go a step at a time following the timeline on the bottom of the graph down here. So the first thing that happens is the endometrium is going to decrease as you go from day zero to five, that's menstruation. Now on day six, FSH is gonna go up, released by the pituitary. And because FSH went up, it activated the ovaries, they started to mature an egg, which means they start to produce estrogen. But remember that backwards inhibition thing, that estrogen going up has now caused the FSH to drop back down. So here we are at about day six. But of course the estrogen going up now triggers the endometrium to start to rebuild quite slowly though because that's right the way through to day 14. so here we are start of day 14. Now on day 14 remember the key event the pituitary releases lh lh causes ovulation which means estrogen goes down and progesterone takes its place lh you will have noticed just kind of goes up and goes back down it's a very short-lived hormone so now we've got progesterone in place and progesterone if you look at the arrow just stays in place right the way through until about day 27, maintaining the endometrium until progesterone drops, which of course then starts us back on day zero, 28 and zero, exactly the same. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna run through this exact chart again, but much faster, 
try and keep up with it to check that it makes sense to you. So if we reset the system back to zero, we've got the endometrium going down, FSH going back up on about day six. The FSH going up triggers the ovaries to make estrogen, which inhibits the FSH, but makes the endometrium build back up. That's what takes us to day 14. From day 14, LH gets released, but goes straight back down, meaning estrogen stops because there's no more maturing egg. Progesterone takes its place. Progesterone maintains the whole system till day 27 when it drops. And we're back where we started. We had that cycle of up and downs of hormones, one affecting the other, affecting the other, but ultimately just making the endometrium grow and break down and making an egg mature. Of course, if that egg isn't fertilized, that unfertilized egg will just be lost with all the endometrium during menstruation. Now, I know quite a few students will panic at that because that's a huge amount of information in big flow charts and cascades. And when asked in the exam to put that into words, you might panic. So let's quickly whiz through how I would describe that entire process that we've just gone through. So here's the diagram for you to refer to if you need it as I run through, but we'll start off key fact, the average menstrual cycle is 28 days. The endometrium breaks down over the first five days. That's called menstruation. FSH is secreted from the pituitary gland into the burnt blood around day six. The ovaries are the target organ uh, because they have the specific receptor proteins and the ovaries start to mature an egg and secrete estrogen. Again, please remember the key things with any hormones. What's its name? Where is it produced? What's its target organ? What does it tell that organ to do? Always cover those four points in any explanation and you'll be fine. So given you've got the four hormones, FSH, LH, estrogen, and progesterone, you've got four things to hit about them. You've got all those key points that you've got to get in there. OK, so if we're secreting the estrogen, the estrogen stimulates growth of the endometrium in the uterus, but it also inhibits FSH production. So only one egg is matured. That's to reduce multiple births. Um, on day 14, the pituitary secretes LH, which stimulates ovulation, which is the egg release from the ovary. The ovary stops secreting estrogen because there's no more maturing egg and they start secreting progesterone instead. Progesterone maintains the endometrium. And if no egg is fertilized or implanted, progesterone stops at around day 27. Of course, if this woman does get pregnant, then an egg will implant and that triggers different hormones to say, well, we'll, we'll stop everything. We don't want to get rid of this, but you don't need to know about that. OK, it's only if there isn't a fertilized egg implanting or an embryo implanting um, that progesterone would stop at day 27. If it stops, then the endometrium breaks down and we go back to where we start. So take a screenshot of this if it's helpful, but this is just a description of what's on the flowchart diagram up there and what was on the graphs and on, on the last couple of slides. So hopefully that all made sense. It is a very complex process. You're likely to interpret hormone levels from a graph or specifically ask, you know, what does estrogen do or when is LH released or things like that. So do go back and really revise this. What we're going to do now really, really quickly is just revisit something that I gave you uh, three lessons ago at the end of the first lesson when we were talking about the endocrine glands. And it was this hormone summary table. I'm only giving you this now because we've now covered all the hormones that you need to know in your GCSE specification. So I wanted to give it you absolutely full and complete and all in bold print, in, in dark print. Remember some of the ones we hadn't covered before, I'd left very gray, okay? So you've got growth hormone, FSH, LH, thyroxine, insulin, glucagon, and adrenaline, testosterone, estrogen, and progesterone. This table shows all of the four key points for all of those hormones you need to know. So make sure you thoroughly revise this table of information. Right, there's only one more video to go in the body communication playlist, and it's number 10, which is control of fertility. Now, it's very, very important that you've totally understood everything from this lesson on the menstrual cycle, because a lot of what's in the control of fertility is application of what we've just done. So make sure you've understood this one before you head to that one. But that's the last one to do in this playlist. As always, I'll ask you to subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already. Please do give this video a like if you found it useful and do head over and look at the extra information that I've got on my Facebook page as well. Thank you.